Hello everyone, welcome to the course Basic Cognitive Processes. I am Dr. Ark Verma from IIT Kanpur. We have been talking about memory in our uh, most recent lectures. In the last lecture, we also talked about long term memory. Uh, previous to that, we have been talking about short term and working memory and even sensory memory. Now, today I am going to talk to you about types of long term memory. We will go into more detail about what are the different kinds of content that long term memory has and we will also talk about some of the investigations into how the different areas of the brain uh, contribute to uh, formulating these uh, different kinds of memories. Also what happens when some of these brain areas are damaged and how does that impact people's uh, recording of that memory. Let us say uh, two major uh, divisions of long term memory can be done along the lines of explicit and implicit memory. Now, explicit memory is simply uh, that memory that you can recall and describe and you know talk about in more detail while implicit memory is that uh, about which you cannot talk in more detail, but you can certainly demonstrate that memory by performing a particular skill or engaging in a particular task. On a different note, explicit memory consists of two parts episodic memory that is memory for personal experiences, episodes say for example, as I was saying in the last class, if I ask you to describe uh, a, a summer vacation spent at one of your grandparents house, those kind of things come under what is called explicit memory. What comes under semantic memory is your knowledge about facts, uh, is uh, your uh, knowledge that you have gained over period of time that apple is an edible fruit, that peacock is a bird, that whale is a mammal, all of these are facts. The Prime Minister of India is Narendra Modi is a fact. So, all of those kind of information and you see a lot of uh, early school quizzes uh, uh, having general knowledge, they basically ask you to remember facts. So, that all is also part of what is explicit memory. So, explicit memory will contain the e e uh, episodes that is the experiences you have had which you can actually simulate by uh, remembering them, reliving them in some sense and the knowledge of facts which you do not need to relive in any uh, detail whatsoever, but you at least need to remember what that fact particularly was. Now, uh, another kind of memory which I was just mentioning, implicit memory is basically memories that are used without awareness. So, you are kind of using those memories without really consciously being aware of them. So, the contents of uh, you know implicit memory in that sense cannot be reported. The fact that I learned how to drive a car and that I drive a car uh, almost every day now uh, still does not mean that if you ask me exactly how uh, did I learn to you know uh, maneuver the brakes or how did I learn to uh, you know uh, control the pedal. Uh, how did I learn that task? I cannot really talk about that. It was a procedure, it was a skill that I acquired and obviously, I have still retained that skill and that can be uh, you know demonstrated if I drive the car right now. But if you ask me to give a description, that becomes slightly difficult and in that sense, implicit memory is memory that cannot be reported, but demonstrated via action. So, if you get these two basic concepts right, this is pretty much what your long term memory will contain. Now, implicit memory, uh, trying to elaborate on that a little bit, implicit memory can be of three types, priming, procedural memory and memory that is gained through conditioning. Now, priming basically is a phenomena of if you repeat a particular stimulus where you present a particular stimulus, the presentation of this stimulus will kind of make you ready, make you prepared, uh, make you react better to the presentation of another stimulus which is similar in some way to the first stimulus that was presented. You will find it easier to recognize words that are familiar uh, or the words that you have been recently used. If you are reading a particular novel, you are reading a particular book and then maybe in this lecture I use one of the words that you have read in the book, you will very quickly recall the meaning of that word. So, what has happened is that you have uh, recently just read that book in a read that word in a particular book. that. Uh, will be primed by my mention of this word. So, your memory uh, for the meaning of that word kind of gets revised in some sense. Another kind of memory under implicit memory is exactly the memory for doing things. Say for example, for typing notes, for riding bicycles, those kind of things. So, procedural memory, the memory for skills and tasks is your implicit memory. 
classical conditioning is one form of uh, learned, learned memory wherein you learn by remembering associations between two kinds of uh, stimuli or events. Say for example, uh, and it has been uh, done uh, you know uh, very uh, very much uh, I mean a lot of research in classical conditioning has been done uh, in psychology uh, uh, the from uh, uh, the simplest examples could be say for example, if you associate uh, a particular stimulus let us say if you associate color white to something unpleasant uh, and say for example, every time you see color white and uh, you know a shock will be administered to you, uh, later you will learn that color white say you know stands for an unpleasant experience. You can and we always link these kinds of memory. Say for example, advertisement industry uses conditioning uh, quite a lot. Say for example, you will see a lot of advertisements that are uh, you know played on the television nowadays have uh, pictures or have things that uh, you know remind you of some pleasurable experience. Say for example, uh, a lot of advertisements have uh, uh, you know uh, women uh, appearing and posing for those uh, particular goods which also sometimes do not have anything to do with women. So, what is happening is uh, the advertiser in that sense is using the uh, sexuality of the woman to really promote uh, you know associations for that particular product and that product uh, today might be anything having nothing to do with women at all. But if the person kind of goes to the store as he has been primed with that pleasurable experience and that pleasurable experience is linked with this particular product, it is very likely that the person will choose that product over a uh, aisle filled of so many different kinds of uh, varieties. So, these three kinds of learnings even though are not really explicit and you cannot really talk about them that yes, I am learning this association and I am going to use this information uh, can still be useful and it will basically be manifested in your choices, in your performances of task uh, and whenever you are going to you know do something. Now, this is basically what explicit memory and implicit memory mean. Now, herein you can see again a graphic description of what the long term memory can be you know uh, structured as. So, you have explicit or conscious memory which contains episodes and uh, semantic memory and then you have on the other hand implicit memory which is not conscious and you cannot probably talk about it uh, as clearly and it basically has the three tasks of priming, procedural memory and conditioning. Now, herein again is a demonstration of how somebody uh, like uh, Cliff here uh, is actually constantly being uh, involved in using both explicit and implicit memories at the same time. A very simple task that you are doing, remember uh, we started this course with saying that we will analyze behavior into many smaller components and see that how these smaller components work together or join together to explain that behavior. That is pretty much what cognitive psychology is about. So, you see here uh, Cliff, uh, this guy is basically experiencing two types of explicit memory and three types of implicit memory at the same time. He might be browsing something on the internet. So, he is probably you know maybe he is checking his emails. So, on one hand he is basically uh, you know looking at this conversation with one of his friends which is episodic. So, he is remembering that conversation with his friend. Also, he is uh, looking at say for example, maybe he is uh, you know remembering some fact about cognitive psychology at the same time which is his semantic memory. He is reading recently viewed uh, words. So, uh, the words which he had we, uh, he might have read recently are uh, read easier and the meaning is recalled earlier. So, that is priming. He is typing that is procedural memory basically uh, doing something that you know he tells that uh, reading uh, red vehicles uh, will make me anxious. So, he is kind of uh, remembering that as well. All of that is happening in the implicit level. So, you see at any point in time and you can take your own examples as well. If you are doing something say for example, if I ask you to plan a vacation uh, you uh, to uh, you know let us say a place uh, any place in India maybe Goa or somewhere uh, you might be uh, you know aware of you know uh, some you might be recalled of some of your previous experiences with that place. So, those episodes will be activated you might be uh, uh, you know aware of that Goa is a you know city uh, which has coast at the coastal area of the India. So, you will remember that semantic fact as well and then at the same time you might kind of you know use some of your other skills which are basically implicit in nature. Say for example, the association that Goa is uh, you know always uh, uh, thought of as a place uh, to have uh, parties and pleasure is already that classical conditioning. The mention of the word kind of makes you happy that is what classical conditioning is happening. So, implicit memory is also being invoked here. 
Now, this is again an example to say that we are using all these different kinds of memory almost all the time and this interaction and interdependence is already always playing out. Now, let us come to try and you know seeing some experimental studies about these uh, explicit and implicit memory. So, we will kind of gradually be talking about that. Now, uh, Tulving basically said that the defining property of the experience of episodic memory is uh, that in, uh, involves mental time travel. So, if I ask you to describe me in more detail about a vacation that you had in let us say the year 2000 and where did you go and what were the experiences you had while you are recalling that going to that place you are transported in some sense to that time and era and in that sense you are experiencing back that entire episodes. So, that is pretty much what the episodic memory is doing. It is asking you, it is uh, uh, allowing you to do this kind of mental time travel. Telving he describes this experience of mental time travel that is episodic memory as self knowing or self remembering. So, as soon as you start looking into your memory and uh, start recalling previous episodes that have happened, previous experiences that you have gone through, you are basically invoking or exercising your episodic memory. It can be referred to as remembering or it can be referred to as self knowing. In contrast to the mental time travel uh, property of episodic memory, the experience of semantic memory is uh, slightly narrower. So, the experience of semantic memory is basically involving just accessing the knowledge about the world that does not really necessarily have to be tied to that entire experience. To answer some questions about particular facts, uh, whether uh, so on is a bird or it is a mammal or you know, it will not really ask you to invoke the memory of when you first read about or saw a swan. It will just you know the, met the uh, fact that swan is a bird is automatically invoked, it is automatically brought to your memory and you can answer this question in a second or two. So, ideally the semantic memory is basically not about episodes, but it is just about facts. So, you not really uh, you do not really need to travel back in time to where you first saw the swan or where you first read about the swan or were told about the swan. You do not really, really need to get all of that information because that is not relevant to the task. So, what you do is you just get grab the fact that swan is a bird and throw it towards me and say that yes, this is the fact and this is what I know and you are doing this with the help of what is called your semantic memory. Now, there have been neuropsychological evidences on the separation of semantic and episodic memory. So, there has been a lot of debate and there has been it has been uh, said and uh, shown uh, time and again that episodic memory and semantic memory are two different aspects of memory. So, one of the neuropsychological cases that uh, I can talk to you about is the case of Casey who uh, was a guy who uh, was uh, riding his motorcycle at the age of 30. He kind of uh, you know went off a freeway exit ramp and suffered severe damage to his hippocampus and the surrounding structures. So, what happened is as a result of this injury Casey basically lost all of his episodic memory. He now cannot uh, remember anything uh, or any of the relevant events of his past. However, he knows that certain things happened that would correspond to what is called semantic memory. I will tell you uh, things like uh, he is aware of the fact that his brother died 2 years ago. Now, that is a fact, but he is not really aware of the uh, things related to his brother, brother's death and the circumstances that he experienced the fact that, uh, of his brother. He is not able to recall that. Casey also remembers the fact that where say for example, eating utensils are located in the kitchen and the difference between a strike and a spare in bowling. So, he remembers these things as facts, but he does not remember the episodes uh, linked to where he learned all of this knowledge. Also, Casey has lost. So, Casey basically on the basis of these things you can say he has lost the episodic part of his memory, but the semantic part of his memory is almost all right. Okay, because he knows all the facts, he knows uh, say his brother reside, he knows uh, you know what the kitchen is, he knows uh, you know other things about the bowling game, but he just does, does not know whether he has bowled ever or say for example, if you ask him to describe when did you, where did you go to bowling last week, he will probably not be able to tell you that. A contrary case to this one to the case of Casey was that of an Italian woman who was in normal health until she effort, uh, suffered an attack of encephalitis at around the age of 44. Now, the first signs of problems after this encephalitis attack were headaches and a fever which was later followed by uh, hallucinations lasting up to 4 to 5 days. 
Now, when this woman returns home after a six week stay in the hospital, she started having difficulty in recognizing familiar faces, familiar people. She also had trouble shopping because she could not remember the meaning of the words on the shopping list. So, she would read a shopping list, she shall not remember what these things are which are written here. She could no longer recognize famous people, she could no longer uh, you know recall facts such as the identity of who Beethoven was or uh, the fact that Italy was involved in World War II. Uh, because she is an Italian woman, you could ask these kind of questions. She, all of these semantic facts, all of these uh, things are completely absent. However, despite this severe impairment of memory for semantic information, she was still able to uh, remember events in her life that were going on currently. So, she could remember what she had done during the entire day that you know say for example, I woke up at uh, uh, you know 9 am, I had, a, I had my breakfast, I went for a walk and I you know did some uh, study, all of that she remembers. Uh, and say for example, also things that happened weeks before or months before, basically those that were episodes. So, Although she has lost all her semantic memories, this Italian woman is still able to form newer episodic memories. Now, if you kind of contrast the cases of KC and the case of this Italian woman and you put them together, it will basically demonstrate to you what is called a double dissociation, a double dissociation between episodic memory and semantic memory. So, you know uh, certainly that episodic and semantic memory are two different concepts and administered by probably two different brain regions. Now, here and you can see this double dissociation aware, uh, but if you do not remember what double dissociation means, you might refer to one of the lectures on the methodology part, wherein double dissociation basically tells you that if a patient is uh, okay in skill A, but uh, deficient in skill B, if patient 1 is uh, bad at skill A, good at skill B, patient 2 is uh, good at skill A and bad at skill B, uh, you can uh, you know deduce from this that skill A and skill B are basically different and are administered by different brain regions. So, this is what you kind of find here that uh, KC is good at uh, semantic memory, but poor at episodic memory and this Italian woman is poor at semantic memory and good at episodic memory. Now, there has also been brain imaging evidence. Uh, to show that uh, semantic and episodic memory are different. So, uh, Levine and colleagues, they did their experiment in uh, 2004. They asked their participants to keep diaries and uh, uh, diaries on audio tape describing everyday personal events. Say, for example, it, uh, it was the last night of our salsa dance class. We went uh, uh, for dinner at this particular restaurant and all of these facts from their semantic knowledge as well that by 1947, there are 5000 Japanese Canadians uh, living in Toronto. Those kind of factual knowledges and what whatever episodes they are having and they kind of uh, audio taped all of these uh, uh, you know in, uh, in a cassette and all of that. So, when participants later uh, were made to listen to these audio taped descriptions while they were in an fMRI scanner, the recordings of everyday events that is episodes elicited detailed uh, you know episodic autobiographical memories while the other recordings which were uh, basically factual knowledge reminded people only of facts and semantic memory was invoked. Here you can see brain areas that were uh, activated by episodic and semantic memories. You will see the yellow areas are basically those uh, uh, activated by episodic memories and the blue regions are those activated by uh, semantic memories. So, you will see there is also a neural level dissociation between uh, episodic and semantic memories as I demonstrated in the uh, you know by the cases of Casey and this Italian woman. Now, the results of this experiment just to uh, summarize indicated that while there is an overlap in the activation caused by episodic and semantic memories, there are certainly major differences. Other research has also found the differences between areas activated by episodic memory and semantic memory. Now, there have been also Obviously, we demonstrated uh, right away that episodic and semantic memory are two different things, but there has also been reports of uh, connections between episodic and semantic memory. Obviously, they have to be connected to uh, you know form a coherent uh, story and give us this coherent sense of being. So, the distinction already uh, although has been made between episodic and semantic memory, uh, they have also been shown to be connected in a variety of ways. Say for example, if we are learning facts 
potential semantic memories. Maybe you are, uh, you know, uh, paying a lot of attention to this video and learning something about cognitive psychology and learning something about, uh, let us say, in this lecture, uh, episoding and semantic memory. You are simultaneously, uh, usually, having an experience as well. So maybe you are sitting in a particular room. Maybe the uh, weather is good outside. Maybe uh, you know you are kind of having this episode of sitting in a particular room and listening to this particular lecture. So while what you will re recall, let us say, is the facts about things about you know episodic memory and semantic memory from this lecture, you will also take away with you this episode of sitting at a particular place and listening to the lecture. So you kind of very similarly uh, you know things that people do in classrooms. So episodic memories, I am just kind of going to elaborate this connection a little bit. Episodic memories can be lost leaving only semantic memories. So 20 years from now, maybe you might still remember what an episodic memory or what semantic memory means, but you might forget wherein or in which setting or say for example, which room were you sitting in watching the video uh, that you remembered these facts, that you uh, first got aware of these facts. Okay. So, this is uh, one of the ways to show that you know during a particular event, during a particular episode in life, you might sometimes uh, you know recall that episode uh, and the semantic facts as well, but it can also be possible that you kind of do not remember the episode, but you at least remember the facts. It really uh, it, uh, very, uh, happens very often with uh, people who have traumatic experiences. Now, semantic memory can be enhanced if associated with episodic memory. Now, research has shown that you try and, uh, you know, associate this knowledge of facts with, uh, you know, with the different kinds of episodes, with the entire episodic experience, you can enhance your semantic memory and it can stay on for much longer. Say, for example, if the knowledge about, let us say, the facts associated with high school graduation, somebody's, you know, farewell party after 12th class or 10th class, uh, you know, has some personal significance, it will be remembered better, you know, a farewell party in class 12th or uh, graduation courses you might have done. If something very significant happened, maybe something pleasant, suppose you won a particular, you know, we had in our college Mr. and Miss Fresher, if you kind of won that kind of a sachet, uh, you will probably remember that entire event much better, maybe, uh, you know, till the time you grow old. So, the idea is that semantic memory that the fact that you won Mr. or Miss uh, Fresher at that day, uh, if you kind of link it with that entire episode of your Fresher's uh, function or farewell function, you will remember that much, much better. Now, Westmarket and Moscow, which they showed that participants did actually have better recall for names of public figures such as actors, singers and politicians whom they would associate with personal experiences. So, say for example, if you have a particular, you know, uh, uh, you are a fan of a particular Bollywood actor or a particular cricketer or somebody and you have probably found him, uh, you know, you met him on a particular airport while you are travelling, uh, you will remember this uh, person maybe better. Okay, if it if it if this person is uh, you know kind of associated with any personal experience. Coming to the third fact, semantic memory can influence our experience by influencing our attention. So uh, the knowledge of facts, the uh, you know all the facts that you remember, can also influence your experience by influencing how you look at things or how you attend to things. Say for example, Abhishek and Aditi are watching a game of cricket, and later when they are asked to recall whatever happened in the game, so Aditi remembers the details of the play. He remembers, say for example, batsman X got caught at square leg or uh, fine leg while playing a pull shot to a spinner. So, it is adequate detail that is there, but Abhishek does not remember this entire information. He just remembers that the batsman got out. Now, it is probably because Aditi had been a player of cricket. She has, uh, you know, uh, figured in her girls cricket team and in, in her school. So, so, she kind of remembers each and every detail about that thing, while uh, Abhishek, who has never been fond of cricket so much, he does not remember it. Now, Remember the chess example which we were talking about in one of the earlier lectures. Because your semantic memory has this knowledge of this facts, you will attend to details better and this attention to details will impact your memory much better. So, this is again one example showing that semantic and uh, episodic memory are linked together. Priming, uh, procedural memory and conditioning are aspects of uh, implicit memory and now let us talk a little bit about them as well. 
Now, priming basically occurs when the presentation of one stimulus, which is the priming stimulus, changes the response of uh, uh, and changes the response to the subsequent test stimulus. Uh, say, for example, if I prime you with the bird and then I later you know uh, ask you that whether swan is a bird or not, uh, because you have been primed with this concept of bird, you will be able to answer that question much faster. This is called one, uh, one kind of a semantic priming. There could be very simply even repetition priming as well. Say, for example, if I uh, you know repeat uh, repeatedly present uh, one word, uh, one kind of test stimulus to you, which is the same or as resembling the uh, later stimulus that will come in, you might be able to answer questions about that later stimulus faster. And it has also been shown experimentally. Say, for example, if I you know show you the word bird, uh, you might respond much more quickly to the representation or same uh, bird or something. Uh, uh, you know, which is also a member of the bird class. Conceptual priming occurs when the enhancement caused by the priming stimulus is based on the meaning of the stimulus. If I repeat the word furniture to you and later the test stimuli consists of let us say a chair or a table or a sofa, uh, you might be able to respond to chair, table or sofa uh, much easier uh, in much faster way as compared to words. So, typical paradigm of priming is I will probably just explain this uh, right away is that you see a test stimulus, then there is a gap and after that yes, you see a priming stimulus, then there is a gap and after that you uh, see what is called a test stimulus. Now, on the basis of the relationship between the priming stimulus and the test stimulus, your responses to the test stimulus might be increased or decreased be faster or uh, slower, be more accurate or less accurate. So, if in an experimental setting, I mention the word furniture in one of the uh, episodes in one of the screens and then after some point in time, on the uh, I present a word called table and I ask you whether it is uh, you know a real word or it is not a real world, uh, you will be able to answer that it is a real world uh, faster because you have just been primed with the word furniture. So, the knowledge associated to all the furniture is activated and because table is part of that knowledge, it gets primed and you can answer anything about the table much quicker and much more accurately. That is what conceptual priming basically means. Uh, many experiments have been done in which researchers have demonstrated implicit memory using a variety of techniques. Say for example, an experiment was done by Peter Graf and colleagues who tested three groups of participants. There were eight uh, patients with Korsakoff syndrome. Now, Korsakoff syndrome is basically a disorder, uh, is, a base, uh, is a very uh, acute memory disorder which happens due to alcohol abuse. So, people do not, people suffer from a very, uh, uh, you know, a very severe amnesia and they could cannot remember a lot of things. So, patients with without uh, amnesia uh, who are under treatment. Uh, so, the second group consisted of patients uh, without amnesia uh, and were under uh, uh, treatment for alcoholism. So, the first group is Korsakoff syndrome, people who are alcoholics and amnesic both. The second group is patients who are not amnesic, but they are alcoholic. And the third patients who had, who uh, did not have amnesia or were not alcoholic. So, three groups of patients they had. They presented these uh, patients with a list of words uh, and uh, asked them to rate the words on a scale of 1 to 5 as to how much they liked the word. So, 1 meant I like this word very much, 5 meant I dislike this word completely. Now, this basically got the participants focused on rating of the words and they could not guess that they will be asked to recall these words later that is what happened. So, immediately after rating the words in the list, participants were tested in one of two ways. Either they were given a test of explicit memory, so they were asked to recall these words or they were given a test of implicit memory in which what happened was they were given a list of three letters and they had to add some more letters to make the words, okay, to make newer words and to make the words that came to their mind. So, the result of the recall experiment showed that people with amnesia performed uh, very uh, poorly and they had a poor recall as compared to the two other control groups. Now, this poor recall kind of confirms that the poor explicit memory is there. So, they are uh, kind of obviously uh, what is expected with patients of amnesia. But the result of the implicit uh, memory test tells a different story. It was found that uh, the percentage of primed words that were created in the word completion test uh, demonstrated that amnesic patients also performed just as well as the control. So, herein you can see the results. So, you will see the in implicit memory test, uh, the uh, amnesic group performs as uh, good as the alcoholic groups and the inpatients. Uh, 
Whereas, in the explicit uh, recall test, the amnesic uh, group uh, fares uh, much poorly as compared to the inpatients and the alcoholic group. So, this is basically one of the tests which also tells you something about uh, uh, you know uh, memory uh, that uh, priming or say for example, implicit memory might still be left intact even though explicit memory uh, it has been uh, suffered uh, you know has been uh, severed due to things like amnesia. Another example of a repetition priming uh, in which a patient with brain damage was presented with uh, you know uh, was, uh, was he was participating in an experiment by Vi uh, Warrington and Weisskranz and they were testing 5 patients with Korsakoff's syndrome. So, the researchers presented incomplete pictures such as uh, the ones which I will show you right away. So, these incomplete pictures were presented to 5 patients with Korsakoff's syndrome. Now, what happens is uh, and they were asked to complete these, uh, they were basically asked to identify what these pictures were. So, you were shown pictures like these and they were asked that what of what each of these pictures meant. So, the results indicated that by the third day of testing, these participants would make much fewer errors before identifying the pictures than they did at the beginning of training even though they had no memory for any of previous days training. So, uh, if you ask them what did we work on yesterday, they will probably not be able to answer. But if you ask them to recognize uh, these pictures, they will they are slowly getting better. So, some learning is essentially happening, some implicit memory is essentially being formed. Again, an example of uh, you know to demonstrate that explicit and implicit memory are slightly different skills. Now, the improvement of performance again just to summarize uh, represents an effect of implicit, implicit memory because the patients are learning from the experience even though they cannot remember the having that experience or they cannot remember the episode of that experience. Uh, here you can see their performance. Now, uh, Procedural memory basically is also called skilled memory uh, because it is memory for doing things that usually require action. Now, the implicit nature of procedural memory as we have talked earlier as well has been demonstrated in amnesia patients who can master a skill without remembering any of the practice that, uh, that has led to this uh, you know skill advancement. With HM they were doing uh, this task called mirror drawing, every day he would go to the psychologist and the psychologist will teach him to do mirror drawing and mirror drawing is basically this, you can see you are looking at an object in the mirror and trying to draw it. So, with HM, uh, he had to just copy this uh, you know thing uh, you know uh, by seeing in the mirror and he was doing it. After days of practice, HM be basically became very good at mirror drawing, though if you ask him about the episode, he will not remember, he will probably say that you know it is the first time I am doing this task, but he is certainly getting better at it. So, implicit memory is certainly uh, you know getting increased and is getting better. This was the case with other amnesic patients as well. See, for example, Jimmy G, the person we were talking about in the first end, could still tie his shoe. So, he knows at least that skill is still there. Clive Wearing, who was a pianist, I have been talking about him in the earlier lectures, still could play a piano. Casey, uh, this guy who suffered a motorcycle accident, later uh, became a librarian. He learned to sort books in the library and could live his life, uh, you know, uh, decently even after that. So, you will see that these kind of uh, you know uh, facts, these kind of demonstrations that amnesic patients can still retain skills uh, learned in the past and even learn new skills, they basically led to an approach uh, of rehabilitating patients with amnesia by teaching them new tasks. Okay. So, it is ok, I mean whatever is lost, the episodic semantic part, whatever is lost, that is all right. The implicit tasks that they can still learn are actually taught them and uh, you know they even though they will not uh, remember the episodes of training, they will certainly remember uh, you know the training they have got, they will certainly remember the skill they have got. And you can obviously also you know uh, associate this with uh, your personal experiences, say for example, do you exactly explicitly remember the day you learned to ride a bicycle or a car uh, or say for example, how to maintain balance while you are riding on a bicycle. But obviously, if given a bicycle, you can demonstrate by riding it that you know the skill of riding a bicycle. So, that skill is there, but that episode might obviously be forgotten. So, another last kind of implicit me memory thing that we can talk about is classical conditioning. Now, classical conditioning basically happens when two of the following kinds of stimuli are prevalent. So, there has to be neutral stimulus that initially does not uh, re result in a particular response and there has to be conditioning stimulus that does uh, result in a response. Say for example, and this was basically this is being uh, borrowed from Ivan Pavlov's experiment done long, long ago. Uh, so, he presented uh, food and food naturally generates a salivating response and then 
what he did was he paired the food with the bell, which again gave the salivating response because the food is present here. Later, it was found that these uh, the dogs uh, who uh, with which this experiment was being done, they started salivating to the bell alone. So, what the dogs have done is they have linked bell with the food. So, every time uh, or whatever response they were giving to uh, the food is now also being given to the bell as well. So, conditioning is, is actually a very important thing, you know, it is evolutionally useful as well, because it allows uh, organisms to develop expectations uh, that helps them prepare for contingency. So, you know say for example, that uh, if you have uh, seen a snake or say for example, if you know there are dark uh, clouds in the, uh, you know, in the sky, it, it might be uh, going to rain, you know, there is a high chance that it will rain and you will immediately, you know, go and grab your umbrella if you are going out for a walk. Now, classical conditioning again is an implicit thing. So, you have this knowledge and you might use this knowledge, but you might not necessarily say, well, obviously, uh, the example of the umbrella, you can still say that I know now it is going to rain, but how did you know it? How did you uh, automatically guess by seeing the thing, uh, by seeing the black cloud that there is going to rain? So, you have kind of uh, learned this over and over again, because you have made these associations. There are so many other skills we have learned through classical conditioning, which are important parts of our implicit memories and which kind of also define how we interact with this environment. That was uh, all about uh, uh, long term memory, about explicit implicit memories, about episodic, semantic and procedural priming and conditioning memories. And in the next uh, lecture, we will talk about some other aspect of memory. Thank you.